This is a prayer of David's. Listen, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Protect my life, for I am faithful. You are my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Now teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I will praise you with all my heart, Lord my God, and will honor your name forever. For your faithful love for me is great, and you rescue my life from the depths of Sheol. God, arrogant people have attacked me. A gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. They do not let you guide them, but you, Lord, our compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your female servant. Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped and comforted me. Well, we've been going through, we're, we're on the backside of the 80s here, just over the halfway mark and moving through. We've got a few more weeks as we go through up to about 89. We, of course, we did the 90s last year. Next year, we we'll go to the 70s. I'm not sure that, that might mean I have to preach in bell bottoms. I'm not sure. Um, and obviously, we have God's written word, so we don't need a DeLorean to go back and focus on these things and experience David's writing and psalm that he has for us. And so, I'm going to talk today about a few things. First, I'm going to talk about what it means to be a divided man. In fact, even more than that, a long division that's been between God and man. And then number two, we're going to look at the heart that David has for God, and of course, then what God does for David and us. I know each week we've been taking time to sort of, like we've been constrained, both Jonathan and Ben and and then myself as well. It's okay, we're going to do the 80s. We're going to try to find something, an illustration from the corollary to the 80s, which some of us grew up in. Some of you are, look back at the nostalgia like I used to on the 50s. But uh, I had the opportunity this last week actually to interview on, the, on my podcast that I do. I got to interview Josh Larson, who uh, works for Think Christian. And he wrote just recently published a book called Fear Not, A Christian Appreciation of horror movies, which is, of course, you're talking about that. Last week, we had 300 kids come to my house asking for candy. It's kind of that time of year, scary movie kind of talk. So we were talking a lot about some of our favorite scary movies, and one that I wasn't allowed to see in 86 because I was only 12, but there's a classic line, and I'm going I'm to guess like two or maybe three people in this room would know what it's from. The very classic horror line, most of us have heard it, it's, be afraid. Be very afraid. Now, who thinks they know what movie that's actually from? Any shout outs? Jaws? It's not Jaws. It, it, it could apply, I mean, a lot of people, Freddy Krueger. I mean, it's certainly apt. Uh, this is it's actually from a remake of a classic black and white film. I was allowed to watch that version because it wasn't nearly as scary. Uh, where is it from, Catherine? The Fly. 1986 brought us a remake of a classic movie called The Fly, creature feature, right? Starring a very young Jeff Goldblum before he went to Jurassic Park or fought aliens on Independence Day. 
And in the film, he plays an 80s scientist trying to perfect a teleporter or a transporter. In fact, one of the best uh, reviews or comments I've seen about this movie, one writer said, in The Fly, I've always felt that Jeff Goldblum's character was inventing the first prototype for the Star Trek transporter. He just needed to work the bugs out. <laughs> well, of course, this, right, this, right, this is a creature feature, so everything goes sideways. He prematurely experiments on himself. A fly gets in the pod with him. They get merged together. They become intermixed inextricably. This inhuman thing is now endemically a part of him. He's bound to it, and it begins to change him. In fact, not just mentally, but physically. And we see that the physical kind of helps us understand he's slowly being given over to this invasive nature inside of him. He's bound to it. For a while, he thinks he can control it, maybe even use it for a beneficial thing, but it slowly drags him down to increasingly horrible and inhuman behavior, mirrored by that physical descent, so that he becomes in every way kind of horrible and disgusting until he's fully given over and his humanity is almost entirely gone. And in this tale, there's no way to reverse it. Right? He can't fix himself, and his fate is ultimately sealed. In fact, it's Gina Davis who puts an end to the nightmare, but that's because she's in a league of her own. So, um, <laughs> but it, it's a variation on the timeless tale, a timeless tale I would call the divided man, someone who has two natures inside of him or her, perhaps, hopelessly shackled to it. It's the same as Jekyll and Hyde, Right? It's the same as the classic Wolfman story. In fact, even many vampire stories, it's that same thing. Being torn between two natures that are warring within, conflicted, trying to get rid of it, trying to harness it, maybe trying to tame it, whatever. Nothing ever quite seems to work, and it's intrinsically a part of the person, and it's dragging them down. So what does this have to do with Psalm 86? Well, David wrote a lot of Psalms. In fact, we've got 150 in your Bible. How many did David write? 75, right down the middle is, is, is what we think, so we get a full half, but we haven't encountered any of them here in the 80s. We've had the sons of Korah, we've had uh, sons of Asaph, and, and so here we have David giving us the psalm that we're going to experience from him here in the 80s. This one has, obviously, you can read through this, we've sung it together as well. There's some very simple and basic and obvious themes, but I think the real key is in the middle. As far as understanding the application for us, It's pinioned right there in verse 11. It says, teach me your way, Lord. I'll live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. And now some of us, if we just came right out of Sunday school, or maybe even if we asked some of the kids who were in the room earlier, we could have asked them, uh, what do we think of David? Do you think of him as a man who has a divided mind? And maybe if you're still a kid in Sunday school, you've only heard certain stories like slaying Goliath and, and other things. You're like, Undiv- why, why does David need to ask for an undivided mind? He's, he's, he's the man after God's own heart, right? That's what Scripture itself tells us, 1 Samuel 13, 14, kind of looking back at a young David. First time we hear are introduced to David. 1 Samuel 13, God says, I found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out all my will. And he could jump into the New Testament in the book of Acts chapter 13, looking back at David. Luke writes like this, yes, look at this is a man after God's own heart, echoes the exact same thing. And to some degree, we know he is, right? Who's David? Well, he's a God-fearing man. He's the evil slayer, whether it's the demonstrative act against Goliath or the many times he he leads Israel and God's people to overcome their adversaries. He's a God, some would say a God follower, a God fearer, a giant slayer a great warrior. In fact, we even see one of the most deepest and intimate friendships in the Bible between he and Jonathan, a covenantal friendship. And so we learn a lot of wonderful, incredible things in which he's mirroring God's heart. But most of it, I'm guessing, most of us here, I'm guessing, to some degree, also know there's the other side of David, right? There's the adulterer side of David when he looks out and sees a woman bathing on a rooftop and decides she will be his. Then he goes and steps it up another degree later by then deciding to get rid of the husband by orchestrating his murder. And then honestly, you speed forward and you see later his kids go crazy. One of them actually winds up just actually committing a sexual atrocity. And part of that's attributed to the fact that it says David never disciplined his kids. He was was poor. He showed favoritism. He He was... He was a delinquent dad, a permissive father. 
So on his own, many times, he's absolutely not living up to that statement, man after God's own heart. And the cool thing about Psalm 86 and other places that we see, he knows it. He's not ignorant of this fact. He's fully aware. And that's why he's crying out, and this is a psalm of lament, give me an undivided mind. I I need you to do it. Right? It's the same echo of what we see in the even, even deeper and soulful and, and heart-wrenching Psalm 51. Also by David, right? He says, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. He says, blot out my rebellion. I talked about it, you might remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about sin. I, I tried to explain that sin at the heart is not doing those don'ts in the Bible. Yes, those are all sins if we do the don'ts. But sin by its nature is really more like cosmic treason against God. That's the idea. It's not just that I'm, I'm an adulterer, right? I murdered somebody or I cheated on somebody. It's like I've, I'm supposed to be an image bearer and I distorted that. I literally misrepresented God from an ambassadorial state of being. I've committed cosmic treason. He's like, I'm rebellion against my creator. He says, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin for I'm conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always right right before me. Against you, you alone, I've sinned and done this evil in your sight, so you're right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born, he says. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. It's the same thing we see, this outcry in the what we call the Old Testament Scriptures. If we jump into the New Testament, we also see Paul reflects this exact same thing in Romans 7 when it comes to this idea of the divided man. Romans 7, he says, For we know, he says, I am of the flesh, sold as a slave under sin. For I do not understand what I'm doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. So I'm no longer the one doing it, but it's sin living in me. It's almost like being tied to that fly, right? tied to that wicked fly in your oint, the fly in your literal living ointment called sin. He goes on, says, For I know nothing good lives in me, that is in my flesh, for the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. For in my inner self I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Right? This is the sin nature that Paul's talking about, that David's talking about. And the world around us today has a lot of bad ideas about humanity. And sadly, many of these have seeped into and even saturated into American Christendom. Right? Biblically, we are not born morally neutral. We're not, in, we're not in the neutral phase. We're actually in sin gear. People are not basically good. And when we do bad things, it's not just because we're a, well, it's just a product of the environment you're brought, in, brought up in. Actually, just listening to a Depeche Mode this last week, one of my favorite 80s bands, but they actually just put out an album. These guys have been going for a long time. A new album they put out this year called Memento Mori, and there was this, I saw the song track, and I started to roll my eyes because the song track was titled People Are Good. And you listen to this song by these guys who've been doing music, being in the entertainment industry for decades, and the gist of the song really is, people are good. Keep telling yourself that. It's like, no, people are not good. We see this even reflected in, even in secular culture, there are some very honest atheists like Bill Maher, he's just like, uh, people are bad, people are selfish. Like we can see this, like human nature is inherently flawed. So I sometimes you watch a movie like The Fly and you're kind of like, oh, that, that fly got into, it's, it's, now he's acting inhuman. It's like, well, human ain't that great at its base level either. Like that fly is just in us from birth. Like biblically, we're a sinner by nature and choice. And we sin, we understand from the Bible, is inherited since Adam. The curse that's come on the earth, the way we feel things externally that press in on us, and then even the brokenness in our own hearts, it's a condition we can't fix. We've been fused with it since the womb. And again, David knows this. That's why he starts right in verse 1. That's why he says, listen, Lord, and answer me, for I'm poor and what? Needy. I'm needy. 
Protect my life, for I'm faithful. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. He's poor and needy. It's like, I can't protect myself. I can't save myself. So he's like, be gracious. Be gracious. And that's that idea of grace, which, which again gets misunderstood today. It gets used so vaguely or in an ambiguous way. Grace literally meaning, give me your unmerited favor. Give me a favor I haven't merited. I know I'm broken. Can I please have your unmerited favor I don't deserve? Be gracious, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life because I appeal to you. He's just say, I can't even have joy without you, God. You need to bring it. He's like, I appeal to you. He's, he's begging. That's the posture. It's because he knows his own neediness. He knows what he lacks. Actually, it reminds me of a quote I love to use from one of my favorite comic books. I was reading it as a younger man after just stopping being prodigal and coming back to faith. I, I quote it in my book, and it makes for a great crossover conversation from pop culture to Christ, and I don't just reference it because the writer might be here. But um, it's a conversation between a robot and this watcher of humanity who's been watching humanity for a long, long time, talking about the inherent flaws in humanity. And he says at one point, history has shown from age to age the human condition. They need a hero. They need a champion. They need a savior. But when salvation has come, they turn on that embodied hope. Why? Because to be saved is to be weak, and to be weak, one must acknowledge that one exists in a constant state of need, that in his natural state, man is found lacking. He actually finishes up by saying, man hates his own neediness. That's true. That's the last thing I want to acknowledge, right? That's why so many refuse to acknowledge God, refuse to acknowledge the need for Jesus, because it's, it's, not, it's not half and half. My, biblically, my sim nature is consuming me if I'm on my own. If I'm on my own. It's not half and half. It's not Jekyll and Hyde or Goldblum and Fly. It's a state of inherent corruption and desperate need that on your own it will consume you. It's not every day I need to wake up and choose which direction I'm going to be. It's, David knows what to do. It's every day you wake up and ask for God's help in the choosing. There's a, that's a big difference. It is a foundational difference and one we shouldn't miss. One is self-reliance, one is admitted reliance and neediness and the need for God. That's just the stunning realization we see in David. Again, he recognizes his own neediness. He cannot do it by himself. That's why he's a man after God's own heart. Actually, there's about, I'm going to just look through seven reasons we can see in this psalm why he is that man after God's own heart. First, because he recognizes his own neediness. And we see this all the way back in 1 Samuel, by the way, even before he he goes up against Goliath. In fact, when he he goes up and says, well, somebody, maybe me, should go up against Goliath, and his argument for why he's a candidate, he says, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I'd grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine, talking about Goliath, will be like one of them, for he's defied the armies of the living God. That might sound arrogant if he didn't finish it up with this. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. Right? He doesn't attribute beating even the lions or the bears or how he can defeat the Goliath on self-reliance. Like, the Lord who rescued me. Look at that. Like, I struck them down. How? Because the Lord rescued me from the alternative. The power was his. That's why we see that he's crying out to God for help. In verse 6, verse 7 Verse 16, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give strength to your servant. The strength I have to take down a lion or a bear or a Philistine, it it comes from you. It comes from you. And then if we go back to verse 11, that key verse where it's just like the meat sort of springs in both directions for me as I was reading it this week. Again, this is why 11 is such a key encounter of cultural verse, because what does David do? He asks to have a proper fear of God. 
He says, give me an undivided mind to what? To fear your name. This is a part too many Christians today, we skip and skate lightly over. We, we don't stop. We, we jump right to God is love, which is absolutely true, but you don't jump to the third act of a play. You don't jump to the climax of a movie. Now, some of you do. You read the cliff notes or fast forward into your streaming service. You ruin the ending, right? That's, that's not where really, God is love. That, that comes in. Love is manifest and given, but it's like reading that last chapter of the book. We see all throughout Scripture that there, after the fall, after the first sin, after the earth fell into a state of brokenness and need of restoration, our understanding starts with fear. In fact, Jesus himself would tell us there is nothing to fear but God himself. Right? You heard the cloud, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. That's circular, that doesn't really make sense, but right, a movie might tell you fear is the mind killer or fear leads to suffering and all that. just, no. Jesus says in Luke 12, I say to you, friends, don't fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. I'll show you the one to fear. Fear him who has the authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. It goes on to talk about God his Father. Right? For the unbeliever, for all of us in our sins, apart from relationship with Christ, the fear of God is the fear of judgment, fear of eternal death, fear of eternal separation. Hebrews even says at 1031, he says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So my mind always goes to the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? It's a face-melting moment if we're in our sins. That's why so many times in Scripture, what does the messenger have to declare when they first show up? Fear not. Like, no, I know you would normally fear because this is someone showing the radiance and is a messenger from God, and you're starting to think it's face-melting time. And the first thing they have to clarify is, fear, no, don't be afraid. It's okay. It's, I'm not going to bring what you expect. Remember, I, I told you to hold on, hold on to that book title by Josh Larson. That the only one we have to truly fear, God, shows up in a relational way and gives us permission to fear not. He declares it, fear not. And then, and, and only then, then, then our fear, it doesn't... It doesn't go away so much as transforms. Right? A biblical fear of God for the believer includes understanding how much he hates sin and fearing that judgment, not the judgment to damnation and hell, because sometimes he also just does just bring some instructive discipline to our lives. Hebrews talks about that as well. We should fear his discipline. It's just like any of you who had a decent dad who did discipline fairly right. Like all, he, all my dad had to do was call my formal name. Right? James Lee Harleman. And I'm shaken. Not shaken because he's going to kill me. Not shaking because he's actually going to injure me in any way. But because I know I'm, I'm in the wrong and I'm going to receive some correction and I'm going to be told that I shouldn't be doing the thing that I'm doing. And I don't like that. And he's big and his, his voice is boom and, 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 it, and I just tremble. And I don't have to be scared, but I fear that discipline and that correction. I don't have to be scared. I mean, as Christians, I don't have to be scared of damnation, but we still need that reverential fear, like a dad who could call our formal name and like, oh boy, I, I know, going the wrong way. And that's why we see four, David's a man after God's own heart, because he bows to God's lordship. He recognized, Lord, there's no one like you among the gods. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago as well. One of the Psalms explains, it's not that there are, he says, all, like, the reason we understand Scripture calls God the living God is because all the others are dead. They're, they're not real. They're fictional. They're wood. They're stone. They're gold. They're made up. They're, they're, they're fabrications of man. Maybe they're even masquerading demons. Because then, it, of course, it goes along in verse 10 to say, you alone are God. So there's no one like you amongst all the other false gods. There's no works like yours. And really, the pivot, structurally, if you're a music guy, I was here and Kat was explaining this to me last, this, this last weekend. Musically, this, this structure of this psalm is set up so that the middle, right in the center, is that line where it says, all the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord. Like, that's the center. Like, for application, for me, it really just strikes and spreads from verse 11. But the center of this song is everyone's going to bow down to you. Amen? 
Amen. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Right? Guys, if, if the only thing we have to fear really is God himself, and he says, you're my child, fear not, like everything else ratchets down, right? It's like if you're being like, if you're being like knocked down by the kid who takes your lunch money at school, but then that weekend you survive like an actual horror movie and the, the giant monster and you either evade it or slay it. That bully looks way smaller the next week, doesn't he? Like, I don't have to fear that. It might be annoying. I don't have to fear it. Everything else ratchets down. All the other fears of the world ratchet down because the, the, thing that would, the only thing that should really bring me fear that towers above all those other things says, fear not. Says, fear not. There's such humility in David then as he recognizes God's lordship. We see it in verse 16 when he says this, this line, which is poetic, and people struggle with interpretation. He says, save the son of your female servant. Not save your son. He says, the son of your female servant. Some translations will say son of a handmaid. And some, some actually think it was David here is talking about his actual mother, and maybe she was humble. Other, others stretch it to be a prophetic hinting at Jesus and Mary. Uh, I lean more on the cultural and poetics allusion here, what he's saying is, I'm a servant born in your house. Like he's, not saying, he's not even claiming his son status. He's saying, I'm born like a handmaid who, who births the servant in the, in the big household where there's lots of servants, you know, downstairs in the lower quarters. I'm just the, I'm the son of a servant. Some of you might remember the prodigal son story. When, he, when the prodigal son comes home, what does he think he's going to do? It's like, I'm going to go back and humbly repent. Maybe my dad will let me be like a servant in his house. And of course, the dad welcomes him, big embrace, open arms, calls him his son, throws him a party. But the, but the posture of the prodigal, the posture even of David is, I'm, I'm just, all, I deserve only to be a servant in your house. It's God who declares and lifts him up and says, son. It's like we shouldn't, we shouldn't be entitled in terms of being treated like sons and daughters. Like the posture is, I, boy, I, I'd just be happy to be here, serving in the house. So we need to be, the way he, David approaches God is this humble posture that acknowledges God's nature then. It's not as if he's scared of him and he's, he's cowering and bowing. He's just being humble because then we see he knows exactly. We see David trusts in God's nature in verse 5 and 13. He says, I know you're kind, ready to forgive abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Like, other, apart from you, like you rescue my life from the grave, from hell, from damnation. Like David's called on his Lord and Savior, and for him and all who do, by the way, there is, as he says, faithful love ready and waiting, kindness ready and waiting, abounding, forgiveness of sins. For, God, for whom? For all who call on him. That, that's the sad that's the sad other side of that is no call, no love. All who call on you, you're, re you're ready to give that love, bestow that kindness. And sadly, we see then not just, not just a division in our each of our individual minds, but we do see at the end of the age, as Scripture says, there will be a divided mankind. It uses the idea of sheep and goats, one side and the other, the Lord's right hand and His left hand. The ultimate divide of mankind, some to salvation and some to judgment. But Joel 2, the Old Testament, Acts 2, in the New Testament, Romans 10, they all say everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah, apart from God and God's mercy, life ultimately is a horror. It's, it's more horrible, horrible than any horror movie we might watch in October. But under the cover of His grace, there's nothing to fear. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? And a natural extension of that is then where we see David's after God's own heart manifest. Because we see him then he's asking for God's direction. In verse 11 and 14, he's not just treating his salvation like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Like the one who truly recognizes God as God, bows to God, loves God, being saved by God. They don't crave their own direction anymore. They crave God's clarifying direction that is often quite opposite to our own. Again, verse 11, key verse, teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I need to be taught by the Word of God. I need to accept that as truth. There's no more my truth. It's His truth. 
God's truth, Jesus' truth. He says he is the truth, again, singular. And people who are opposed to God, and he's got the juxtaposition right here in verse 14. He says, God, arrogant people have attacked me, a gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. What's unique about them? They do not let you guide them. The people opposed to the people of God, like David, they don't let God guide them. They're opposed to God. Now, today, most of us are probably not attacked like David was. Like we, he, he was literally attacked by armies, literally attacked by seditious people within his own kingdom. There's all sorts of, of literal threats to his life, which most of us don't face. All the Christians in the world today absolutely do as we move around other parts of the world. We're probably more likely being attacked with seduction. It's the seduction from the world. Like those who don't let God guide them in our culture around us are saying, take up these ways or, or just take up your own way. Right? Edit out the parts of God's word you don't like. Life, life is about your truth. You define and determine your identity. You do. All, all these things, that, those ideas are antithetical to the gospel. Like, so the attacks, the enemies that usually come at us are just those, those ones that are candy-coated, right? Come to the dark side. We have cookies. And so we see David doubles down. He pledges himself to God in verse 12. He says, I'll praise you with all my heart, Lord my God. I will honor your name forever. Right? Forever, no matter what, despite any scorn, despite being countercultural, despite the allure of well, today, the, the, despite the allure of idolatry, which today usually is the idolatry of self. Like the person after God's own heart, like David, he starts at a place of complete need, utter reliance, all the way down to then pledging himself to praise God forever. I'll praise you with my heart, Lord my God. I will honor your name forever. And so what of us? Are we a people after God's heart? Do we recognize our neediness? Do, do we cry out to him regularly for assistance, for aid, for help, for rescue? Do we have proper fear of him in the right way, the relational fear that casts out that fear of damnation and replaces it with reverential fear of how you just honor a good father? Do we bow to his lordship? Do we recognize his sovereignty in our lives while also acknowledging his nature and the fact that he is kind and merciful with us? He, if he expected me, like James, if you pledged yourself to me, James, today, okay, I expect perfection tomorrow. I've been, I've been screwing that up for years now. He's very merciful as I walk a path of sanctification, ready to forgive, giving me daily kindness, daily grace. And do we ask then for his direction? Like we have to dare to ask, realizing that sometimes it's going to say what we're going to hear by opening his word, listening to the Holy Spirit. It's going to be that way you think you want to go? No. No. It's got to happen sometimes. It's going to happen a lot. The whole idea of repentance is a turning from and turning to. That's the easiest way to remember repentance. You hear the word repent. It's turn from to. I'm turning from something, usually my errant way, to his more excellent way. That course correction is probably going to happen daily. And will we pledge ourselves to him forever? What a fantastic prayer to start each day. Give me an undivided mind today, God. Clear everything else out. Now you go back to Psalm 51. David says, Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. Lord, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David's saying, Remove that fly from my ointment. Remove that sin nature, extract it, make me whole. Otherwise, I'm trapped in a horror story. I hope this can characterize us, not in achievement, but in heartfelt pursuit. Final reflection on horror. I've been rereading the original Frankenstein, the original, original Gothic horror story, novel by Mary Shelley, right? I've been reading a copy with some fantastic illustrations by one of my favorite artists, Bernie Wrightson. And the, the creature, the monster, 
He says, polluted by crimes and torn by the bitterest remorse, where can I find rest but in death? That's what the compromised creature cries out at the end. It's basically the cry of a sinner who doesn't know the hope of the gospel. And it's the ending we should expect from a writer who, at least at that time in her life, was married, had married an, a passionate and avowed atheist. It's actually surprisingly close to the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, who after that lamenting I read earlier, he cries out himself, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But Paul actually knows the answer. It's a rhetorical question. And he finishes, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. I'm not left in that wretched state. Death is not the best I can hope for. Just as David cries out in Psalm 51, save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. I pray everyone here would have that heart. And if you didn't have it today or walk in with it today, that you have it walking out, just a taste of it, a taste of the psalmist and his song and his earnest plea and cry to have that neediness filled by the true God and Savior. I pray that everyone here has that heart and that they'll put their trust in a God who promised to save you for thousands of years, set up a people with accruing prophecies that all were pointing to a coming day and a coming Messiah. That's what David looked forward to. And the God who then 2,000 years ago sent that Messiah into the world, his Son and Savior Jesus Christ, the one that we all then look back and realize, the one Paul preached about, who died as an atonement for sin, a cover of faithful love and forgiveness for all who cry out to him, for all who follow him, who shed his blood and had his body broken, as we get to remember today, in communion. The one who says, fear not, because Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? And promises eternal life for all who put their trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you that we can worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you that we can hear from a songwriter thousands of years ago, singing the same song that we sing today in your honor and for your praise and for your glory, recognizing in himself what he needs, what we all need, and recognizing how you satisfy it so fully. As I hope all of us rest in that today. Rest, and rest not only that we have your kindness and your mercy, but yes, even those days or maybe we quake a little bit because you have to put your arm on our shoulder and give us that fatherly course correction. Pray that we would have the reverential respect and also the eagerness like little children being shown the way to go, the way to model you with the fearlessness and faithfulness of a little children as Jesus talks about. Pray we put that trust in you today. Pray that all of us would have it and be able to come to the Lord's table with happy hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.